A warm welcome to all of you out there in the vast virtual world. And I know that you've come from everywhere to hear the RSL's brilliant speakers this evening. I'm Lisa Pignanese, I'm chair of the Royal Society of Literature. And it's my very great pleasure to be here to launch this first of our RSL 200 events, which celebrate 200 years of the Royal Society of Literature, that historic fellowship of writers that is ever alive to the changing and to the new. Our partners tonight are the great and wonderful British Library, the Living Knowledge Network, which broadcasts to libraries across the UK, and the Union Chapel itself. The Literature Matters RSL 200 series brings together some of the world's best known writers for unique explorations of the impact of literature on their lives and indeed on society as a whole. Before I introduce you to our truly fabulous speakers this evening, let me just signal that the next RSL 200 event is with novelist David Mitchell and composer Brian Eno, again in partnership with the British Library on Thursday, 8th October. Members of the RSL, I should mention, attend these events and all our events for free, so do join us. But tickets can also be booked through the British Library. While we aren't able to be in the same room together tonight, we do take questions. Just look at the bottom of the screen and type. We will get through as many of these questions as possible. At the top of the screen, you'll find tabs to open that will enable you to buy a selection of Stephen Fry's books online, including the chance to pre-order your copy of his new book, Troy. There's also a tab there to click, which will enable you to give your feedback on this event and various social media links too, so do tap away. And now to our wonderful duo this evening. To introduce Stephen Fry properly would take most of this hour. Writer, novelist, actor, comedian, larger than life personality, unafraid to engage in championing mental health issues or lending his way to important public interventions. Stephen has somehow even been able to give the word intelligence, popular repute in a climate where its value has not always been high. He grew up in a house with colossal bookcases filled with classic works of literature, using them as medicine cabinets to treat his childhood. He has remarked that writing is a newer technology, only five or 6,000 years old, by which we can change utterance into permanence. Once, when asked for writing advice, he responded, the important thing to do for those who want to liberate their writing is to be able to let go of their self-consciousness, to allow words to write for them. After captivating readers with his formidable mythos and heroes, Stephen, in his new book, Troy, published at the end of this month, turns his attention to another great narrative from ancient Greece, Troy. Richly reimagined, witty, and spellblindingly told, Troy explores the timeless human passions that beat at the heart of this age-old story of heroism, desire, despair, and revenge. Shapi Korsandi established herself as one of the country's finest comedians in 2006 with her sellout Edinburgh show, Asylum Speaker, which told the story of how her family were forced to flee Iran and gain asylum in the UK. The show led to the publication of her childhood memoirs, A Beginner's Guide to Acting English. Her first novel, Nina is Not OK, came out in 2016. She's appeared on numerous TV and radio shows, including Mock the Week, Have I Got News for You, and of course, QI. She recently received the James Joyce Award from University College Dublin. Would it have been me? She is the Vice President of the British Humanist Association and is also currently hoping to receive an apology from Ealing Council for consistently failing to remove her bins on time. Her screenwriting debut was in the form of Sky's Little Crackers in 2011, and she's now working on a drama script for BBC television. Stephen Sharpie, over to you. So, hello, Stephen Fry. Hello, Shappy. It's so nice to be here with you in this beautiful, deserted Union Chapel. It's rather extraordinary, isn't it? It's the first reasonably public event I've 
been involved in since the 15th of March when I was in the Royal Festival Hall. Oh. And it's a rather amazing experience, really, seeing this empty. We, there is no audience, really. I mean, you, you've got some family here and we've got our that's camera true. people, but that's it. I kind of, I think it's beautiful, though, because every time I've been in this room before, it's been heaving. We've been watching comedy, performing comedy, watching bands. Yeah. And now it's just like a still old friend. And <laughs> I'm delighted to be chatting with you. And me, you. Literature Matters. Now, this is a, 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 a real uh, exciting thing for me because I get to sit here and ask you whatever I like <laughs> about literature. And I guess the first thing I want to ask you is that obviously you're known as someone who is terribly well read. When did you, at what point in your childhood did you discover? Well, I was always quite sort of pertly adept at reading and writing from a very early age. Um, I think, and I, this isn't false modesty, because I was so bad at everything else that nature is odd like that. And, and I have, as the old joke has it, Van Gogh's ear for music, and um, I can't paint or draw, and I can't, you know, run in a straight line or catch a ball or dance or, or, or you know, do almost anything. But, but language from a very early age was extremely important to me, and I, I, I'm sure... You're like that as well as a, as a reader and a comedian and some, some of whom words have always had a very special part of one's, you know, consciousness and being. And the surprise is that it's not true of everybody because it is the miracle of humanity, this thing that we are doing. And I'm doing it no more by talking than you are by listening. You're processing language just as much as I am by talking. And it's an incredible, incredible art. And I've always thought it. I always found words remarkable and I remember very early at school getting uh, stared at and treated as peculiar because a music teacher had written the word orchestra on the blackboard to she was going to start and tell us all about the instruments in the orchestra as you always do um, and I yelped cart horse <laughs> because I saw the anagram just coming out of it a bit like some sort of strange floating thing I saw the letters rearrange and um, uh, and people thought that was odd uh, and I used to read, it was a boarding school, and I used to read stories. I mean, Alistair MacLean, you know, sort of MacLean, is it? Uh, thrillers and things under the covers with a torch in the dormitory at night. I was always the one asked to read the story, and I loved doing it. Uh, but it really took off for a number of reasons, which I think you'd probably understand. Well, I know you will. Uh, when I was about maybe 11 or 12, growing up d deep in the countryside, um, far from the nearest habitation, or as Sidney Smith, the great um, early 19th century wit, put it when he was moved to a new parish. He was a, a divine, uh, a parish priest, and he wrote a letter to a friend and said, I find I am simply miles from the nearest lemon. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it kind of gives, and I, we were miles from the nearest lemon in, in rural Norfolk, you know. You'd have to, have to find one in a market in Norwich somewhere. But... And my parents didn't approve of television very much, so there was a tiny little television store that, you know, which came out for big events like Churchill's funeral or man landing on the moon. Uh, but one rainy Sunday, I, I watched a film and I was absolutely captivated by it because of the language. I had never heard people speaking in the way they did. I remember a man saying to a woman, I hope I will not in any way offend you if I say that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. Oh, and I remember thinking, wow, why? And, and, and I sort of followed this thing and I laughed, it was funny. And I ran to my mother afterwards and I said, mother, would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? And she said, what are you talking about? Anyway, she then said, oh, because I explained what I'd been watching. She said, that's the importance of being earnest. And I said, well, what is it? She said, well, it's a play, and it was the film. I'd watched the film, the Anthony Asquith film. Well, being in the middle of the country, the nearest library was a long way away, but there was a mobile library, this little grey van that would come every other Thursday and, and about half a mile down the lane would stop, and a few cottages and houses in our house would go and queue up. So I went into this, this Pantechnicon and, and asked if they had the importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde. 
When you uh, were, what, tw uh, 11, yes, 12? And, and, the, and the, the lady with the powdery cheeks and the chain and her pince-nez said, well, let me have a look, young man, and she gave it to me. And I rushed home. It was a collection of four, his four comedies, you know, Woman of No Importance, Ideal Husband, and Lady Windermere's Fan. And, and I read them, covered, and particularly The Importance of Being Honest, which I kind of learnt by heart. I was just, I wanted to own it, I wanted mm. to eat it. Uh, and then two Thursdays later, I rushed down and I said, have you got anything more about Oscar Wilde? And she found a complete works. So I took that and I started reading it. Some of it, uh, mysterious, the soul of man under socialism and uh, essays like that. But you know, there were the children's stories, the wonderful fairy stories and other things. And I just found him mesmerizing the way he used words. And then I came back two weeks later and I said, have you got anything more? She said, well, you've just had the complete works, and that, if that's the complete works, that's the complete works. Um, and so I went up and down the library shelves, and I saw a book, The Trials of Oscar Wilde. I said, but there's this. She looked at me, and she said, how old are you, young man? And I sort of lied. I said, 14. <laughs> she said, I don't think you should be reading that. I said, no, please, please, I'm, I'm really, really, you know, I admire this man so much. She said, well, all right. She stamped it out. And I started to read about this extraordinary fellow and his group of friends. And I, I was mesmerized by the power he had over people through his wit and his language and his charm and this circle. And then slowly it, it imploded. His world became this nightmare of the trial mm. and imprisonment. And of course, somewhere inside myself, I knew that I shared a nature mm. that was like his. So it gave me a terrible shock. I associated the literary power and the majesty of his language and the, such a high sense of art and beauty and, and, and it was such an exciting world, but at the same time doomed. Mm. And then I would get on a bicycle and ride to Norwich, which is about 12 miles away, and there was a big library there. And the equivalent of the World Wide Web is the bibliography, the card indexes. You look at a book and in the back, other uh, source books for that book and you so I would make lists and I would read about Reggie Turner and Richard Le Gallien and Max Beerbohm and obviously um, Bosey his lover and all these other characters until I, it widened and widened and over the three or four years of my early adolescence I had become a sort of mad addict of late 19th century literature and all the connections that then grew and grew right up through to the sort of Paul Bowleses and then American writers. And it wasn't all the sexuality, though. There was that charge. And I found libraries, places of magical eroticism and danger and a kind of kingdom. You're like the male Matilda. Well, yes, I suppose. And I don't know if you're the same as me. I, I, if... If I'd been born 20 years later, mm. I would have been a lot less convinced that my life would be one of seclusion and guilt and shame and mm. hiding away. But also I would never have, I suspect, had this key to literature. It may be, it may be almost a, a bad reason to, to welcome and to, to find literature. Uh, uh, the fact that it chimes with something... My instinct when you talk about um, finding Wild at such a young age and connecting with him, yeah. um, actually that's a very tender age to realise that that thing about yourself that you're keeping hidden belongs also to somebody that you admire so much and yeah. then to read yeah. what the officials of the day did to him and then to be just 12, 11 or 12 and come across homophobia yes. of that extent to someone you admire yeah. so much. Do you think that was e like contributing to perhaps not being able to... I think it's a double thing because in mm. some ways you're also getting a vindication. Um, uh, some of the uh, older people watching may remember Panther Books, which was a, a paperback imprint. I think Anthony Blonde was the publishing uh, uh, genius behind it. And they published um, Roger Perifit and uh, Jean Genet and, and European, what we'd now call queer literature, I suppose. Uh, and there was a freedom and a, and a fury and a zest about that that, that, uh, that made it slightly less... I mean, the rule was, if you were British... 
you would escape England. You would, you would, you would go to, through France to Italy, to Capri, or to, mm -hmm. to Tangier in North Africa, uh, to the sunlight and the decadence and the freedom and the license of, uh, uh, away from the sort of dark, fusty Puritanism of, go west. of Britain. Go <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but, I mean, I mustn't paint myself as someone who was just, you know, pure literary figure. I also, I mean, I loved P.G. Woodhouse, and to this day I love P.G. Woodhouse, and I, I loved um, uh, Conan Doyle and Evelyn Waugh and, um, uh, and, and many other writers. And, uh, and I loved and still love Agatha Christie, and I used to tear through books. Oh, at, yeah. at a huge, partly insomnia was the other thing. Oh, can you, do you find it easy to read with insomnia? Because some insomniacs, part of the um, battle with it, it's uh, difficult to concentrate on reading. Well, fortunately, I'm no longer um, as insomniac. But what I used to do was, yeah, it was difficult to read in bed while uh, trying to get to sleep and then to go, I'll read. And, mm. uh, so, but if you, you go and sit in a chair and read, then somehow I found I, I could do an hour of reading in a chair and then go to bed and could sleep. It's a weird way of doing it. But, but um, yeah, the question is, if the internet had existed, would I have turned to books? I, I really doubt, of, in the original sense of doubt, I fear. Um, uh, and in that sense, as in so many others, I feel really lucky to be yeah. the generation I am. Abs Do you, know, you know, that is a big thing for... Um for now and you know I have two children who are my eldest certainly is far more interested in the dramatic visual yeah. of um, online whereas you know I'm his mum he grew up reading we grew yeah. up reading together and and you know I, I used to read to him when he was nine and big uh, a book called Johnny Swanson about a boy who'd lost his son his dad in the war and and then was being bullied and his mother's house was being taken away by a horrible landlord and he was nine and he got really teary and he yeah. reacted emotionally to it um, so I'm hoping just recently we had a chat and he said, well, I just can't get into it. And I, you know, my passion is these games. And I was like, you just, you wait till your heart gets broken. <sighs> yes. You know, Minecraft can't help you then. <laughs> then you'll want poetry. Then you'll want words. Because the, I mean, I, be careful what you wish for, of course. And I, I welcomed the digital age when it started to arrive in the late 80s and particularly through the 90s. Um, but. Reading is a private experience between you and the writer. Mm. Absolutely private, unmitigated by anything. It's the page, it's, it was historically printed and you own it. Mm. Uh, so even reading something on an, in an electronic format on an iPad or a Kindle, uh, there are so many uh, w ways of, you know, you select text, it knows what you're reading. Mm. You, you, you're, all, you're almost aware that you are being watched in your reading. Amazon knows you have this Kindle. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's still participatory. And participatory things are, are good, you know, yeah. they, they predate writing and reading. Uh, they're sitting in caves, telling each other stories was a communal act. So in a sense, what's happening with the, 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 the sort of the lack of privacy in reading now mm. is perhaps harking back to an older period. But I miss the idea of this unique engagement with a writer. It's just you and the writer. You know, I remember when I was at school, um, we had to have a special assembly because local people had been complaining about the children from the school because they were reading on their walk home and not looking where they were going <laughs> when they were crossing the road. And I remember I was one of those children that on your walk home, you, you want to escapism. You know, a, yes. a child doesn't want to just bounce along the road. So we'd read our books and the next thing you know, you're in the middle of the road. And now, of course, it's the same, but with phones. Exactly. So what, and I try not to lament it too much because you have to move with the times. It's pure escapism, that's all it is. And somehow literature has now become this highbrow thing. Ordinary reading has yeah. become a high, uh, regarded as a highbrow pursuit. Um, yeah, and, and that's... It, a it isn't. No, it isn't. And, and I suppose the urgency of, uh, which is why I'm you know, so pleased to be a member of this, uh, uh, so the Literary Society, uh, because so much of it is <laughs> outreach, as they say mm. in the church, you know, trying to you know, fuse with libraries and other institutions to, to make reading a, a, an obvious act of pleasure and not 
not to make it a worthy thing or a medicine or a, a kind of, a, you know, a, a level that you have to reach, but but also transgressive and wicked and naughty and, mm -hmm. and, and full of fun and danger and fizz and juice. La jouissance de la texte, as Roland Barthes used to say, is that the, the, the juiciness, the, the, the pleasure, the joy of the text and, 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 and of the fact that it is a sensory experience. It's not just good for you. Or, uh, or, um, and it's hard to know how to do that. I remember saying to my, my, my publisher when I f first was being published and they were talking about these things called ad shells, which I'd never heard of. And I, I, as so often, I, I kind of, it was too late for me to ask what they were. I'd kind of nodded, but the, actually all they are is glass posters. <laughs> yeah. You put, put a poster in, you know, uh, in, in, on going up tube yeah. uh, escalators and things. Those, those apparently are ad shells. Um, and, uh, and I said, well, maybe instead of spending all that money, maybe, maybe all the publishers should get together and do some television ads in which... I don't know, they show people on buses who are in jungle costume or are diving underwater or in weird because they're reading and the reading is taking them out of the, mm. the, the commuter train or the, or the bus and to show that what, what a portal to, to another world a book can be and how thrilling it is and how dangerous rather than being a sort of specky kind of clever thing to do. I remember reading in... Um one of my favourite childhood books, A Little Princess by Frances uh, Hodges. Hodges and Burnett, Burnett, yes. yes. And there's a bit where um, Sarah Crew, um, she's at this boarding school, her father's in India, and she, she's reading and she says, when I'm reading, I'm totally absorbed in my story. And if someone interrupts her, she says, I, I feel like they've slapped me in the face and yeah. I want to slap them back. Yeah. And I mean, it's that's... that feeling, yeah. it's that feeling that, that for me is, is the, the drug of absorbing yourself in a book I went on holiday to Barcelona with a boyfriend many years ago and I stupidly got absorbed in a book on the <laughs> on the plane I didn't see anything of Barcelona I, I sat outside <laughs> tourist venues um, you know beautiful works of art reading my book while he went and saw the Garda Familia on his own <laughs> and all of that and I just couldn't and he was like we're on holiday I was yeah. like I can't yeah. I can't yeah. and there is that desperate need for escapism, I think, there is. for people who are really voracious readers. Of course, it, almost by definition of what we're saying with escapism and so on is likely to mean a fictional world, and, mm. and, and books are so much more than that. And I wonder what you felt about the cliché, which I, I fear is broadly true, and I, it's absolutely not completely true, that, that men seem to move away from novels. I, I read nothing but novels when I was a teenager, and, and then I, I, I did English literature as a subject at university, and so novels and poems and, uh, 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 were really it, and plays, obviously, but fictional um, creations. But as I moved into my 30s and 40s, suddenly it was history and biography and science. Mm. And to this day, m most of the literature or literary, literary books that I read are biographies of writers yes. or groups of writers. Uh, I, uh, I don't think that's a cliche, but I, I also think it is an age thing. Yeah. There was a very long period of time, sadly, also when I was at university, I simply couldn't read non-fiction yeah. um, I, I couldn't read it and all I wanted to do was read fiction and history became a passion yeah. once I sort of got to about 40 and autobiographies yes. of people who um, are just very good writers yeah. and I, I, I read um, Andre Agassi's autobiography I have quite no, brilliant isn't it isn't it yeah one of the I very have best no sporting in tennis and yeah. I think one of the first lines talked about how much he hates tennis yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. And again, it, it was one of those books I just picked up from someone else's shelf when I was, I don't know, waiting for them to finish off yeah. in the kitchen or whatever. And I was like, oh, can I borrow this? Um, yeah. And so I think that happens. And perhaps as we get older, we, we want to know much, much more 
yes. about the I think world. The, the, the curiosity and, and also all the things we missed at un university or at school about history, all the little yes. all the gaps, you know. So it's wonderful when you, you get these, like the William Dalrymple book on the East India Company or the, uh, the Frankopan, uh, Peter Frankopan book about the Silk Road, all of those sort of books yeah. really do because... Certainly, my generation never learned world history in the way that perhaps no, we ought to have done. No, and so, Frankopan's books, if someone had handed them to me at 20, mm. I, I, would, I would go, um, I've got wine to drink. Yes. I've got, you know, Sylvia Plath to memorise. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Yeah. I'm from the East. I don't need to read about the East. <laughs> but now, of course, it's at my bedside table and uh -huh. I um, have read it. So... Um, the relationship with what can we talk about poetry yes as well because personally poetry has been for me therapy mm. has been the best because the poets speak about our state of mind better than we can yeah. acknowledge them ourselves what was the first poet that really grabbed you and absorbed you um aside from my mother reading the wonderful rhythms of um uh, a. A. Milne, you know, James, James, Morrison, Morrison, Weatherby, George Dupree took great care mm. of his mother, although he was only three. James, James, Morrison, Morrison, all those sort of, yeah. I just loved the rhythm. I just absolutely loved it. Cottleston, Cottleston, Cottleston Pie and things like that. Then really it was uh, a godfather for my 12th birthday, I think, gave me Paul Graves Golden Treasury, which is the absolute standard middle class collection of great English poetry. It's sort of slightly shorter than the Oxford Book of English Verse, but very similar. It, it goes from Dunbar and Chaucer up through its you know, resolutely British uh, poetry. Um, but it contained Keats, and I fell in love with Keats, um, particularly Ode to Fancy. You know, I mean, the, the big odes, obviously Nightingale and Autumn and Grecian Urn and so on. And, and uh, the you know the, what used to be the standard poetic fare for British people um, Tennyson Browning Arnold Thomas Gray those sort of poets I absolutely loved them uh, it took me a long time to to become confident with modern poetry um, but like many teenagers I fell hook line and sinker for T S Eliot particularly Proof Rock and then The Wasteland I mean absolutely adored it and would just bore people with you know, lines and lines from it. It's because um, I wasn't born in uh, England. I was born in Iran and came here yeah. when I was almost four. Um, the po poetry and the rhythm, for me, because it was a new language, mm. and my nature is to feel completely at one with, you know, the, the, the place I'm in. So I wanted to... It was so important to me to get on top of the language, even as a tiny child. Yes. And A.A. A. Milne was everything to yes. me. Yes. Absolutely everything, because my mum used to take us to the library and I would go straight to the poetry section because it was easier to read for me because I was only, you know, I didn't, I wasn't yeah. reading as a toddler. I wasn't, I wasn't doing, you know, English letters, Latin letters. Um, when I first met you, when I came on QI, okay. I was so proud. I told my parents because you instantly quoted Rumi <laughs> to me. So my mum used to read Rumi to me at bedtime yeah. while I was asleep, you know, while I was sleeping. I think Rumi has overtaken Pablo Neruda as probably the world's most popular poet these days. Didn't, yeah. think? didn't Beyonce name her baby Rumi? Rumi I know, yeah. I know. But, um, but they, they are wonderful. It, it's strange because obviously poets can often get rather cross at the idea that they are merely instruments for doling out uh, solace yeah. to unhappy people and unhappy lovers and uh, uh, and for having their words put against a landscape of uh, uh, of a kind of Bob Ross painting yeah. uh, and, and, and some just little like a tiny part of a little poem. phrase. Yes, I yes, mean, there yes. are some, there's a Rumi phrase I, I, I have written down, um, which is sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment, which I think is... Wonderful. I mean, I, it's very, very good. But, but again, like all phrases, if you start making it an aphorism or a, a, a tea towel, it can become rather, rather hopeless. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that it, 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 Persian poetry, as I suppose it 
used to be called Iranian poetry, mm -hmm. Parsi poetry, I guess. Um, the, the, the best known in Britain used to be Omar Khayyam, and, and um, yes. uh, every, every household had its limp leather uh, uh, collection um, translated by Fitzgerald, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the moving figure rights and having writ moves yes. on, and uh, nor all your piety or wit can cancel out a word of it, and, and the jug of wine and loaf of bread and all that. And, and they're all, they're all poets about, don't worry, have a glass of wine, <laughs> drink. Uh, you know, that, you know that, even, though, even these Sufi p p characters yeah. like Hafiz and, yeah. uh, and, and Rumi, they, 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 they believe in, in, in drugs and drink. There's, there's, a, there's yes. a Rumi poem about, about the different types of, you know, about hashish and, and, and wine and, and how there is in everything there is a drug. Yeah. Uh, and that it's, it's really interesting. It's, so different from how we now think of Iranian people and certainly yeah. the theocracy that's... The, the, the essence of Iranian culture is within those poems and, you know, the idea of sharing and the, and the drinking of wine and it's just yeah. so polar opposite to our, uh, you know, the last 30, yeah. 40, 40 years of our culture. There's actually, I was really proud, there's a half um, as poem with my surname in it, Corsandi, where because Corsandi means, con means contentment and joy. And he says, if there is to be a prophet, I'm translating from the Farsi in my head, <laughs> if there is a prophet to be made from this bazaar, this world, yeah. this marketplace that we call the world, it belongs to the humble Darvish. And may, may God make me a, a Khorsandi Darvish, because what's he, what he's saying is that the prophet, the prophet that you get from life... Prophet is, with an F-I, not yes. a... Yeah is, is uh, being a humble, contented person. And all of the chill out, you know, <laughs> vibe that they have, chill out vibe, I never thought <laughs> I would hear myself talking <laughs> about Persian literature <laughs> to Stephen Fry. And the only words that came into my head was chill out vibe. It, it, for me, it's, it's that is Iranians. Yes. You know, you have a problem, they sit and we talk. Yeah. And it's very wild. And where did he come from? Shiraz. Shiraz. A type of grape. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Whereas Britain, it's you've got a problem, make a joke. Yes, and yes, you're right. Have you ever spoken to somebody who's grieving? A, in a, a British person who's grieving puts themselves in a position to console you. If you say, I'm so sorry for your loss, they instantly go, oh, they want to console you. They yeah. don't want you to feel... They don't want to burden you. Yes. Whereas, yes. you know, a Persian would throw themselves in your arms and weep. Yes. So, uh, th there's, what's that word that, that is the culture of hospitality in, in the Persian home? You know, this kind of... Taro. Yes, is that, yeah, where you offer things and you say no, and then yeah. you offer again, and you say no, and then you offer the again. But you have to, yes, <laughs> please walk on my eyeballs, and yes. uh, my children are your slaves. Yes, and, uh, absolutely. It's, 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 it's generous, and it's, it's super abundant in its... Uh, and, and the British are very not like that. Well, it, I got a shock at university because I was going into bars with lots of people for the first time. And I'd say, what, what would everyone like to drink? And Iranian friends would go, oh, don't be so silly. We're all in the same boat. I'll get my own. And all the <laughs> students would go, oh, cheers. I'll have a snack. And I was overdrawn. Whoops, yes. By hundreds of pounds immediately. The, the, there's a... Um there's a very good essay that Ian Forster uh, writes about English, and it's a very famous essay in, 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 um, in which he talks about the, the underdeveloped English heart. But he, he also describes a friend of his from, from India um, who could not understand Forster's kind of emotional accounting. So mm. this friend, who was, of course, we now know was a lover, in fact, of, of Forster's, an Indian lover of his, but... Um, would cry when, when Forster would go up country for a week. He was going to be, and, and Forster would say, look, in, in four weeks, I'm going to go all the way back to England. So to cry now is absurd. You know, cry. And the friend would say, emotions are not potatoes that can be weighed out. You know, if I want to cry at a small thing, I will cry all the tears I have. Yeah. You don't measure them. And, and, and it's part of 
part of Western culture, which has given us technology, the kind of technology and science that we, we, we developed, I suppose, uh, in the way we did, is measuring things, mm. even things that are unmeasurable. And I suppose one of the pleasures of art is that it, it, it takes us away from that world of measurement yes. and allows us to feel enormous wells of emotion small transactions in, you know, that's the great thing about, about the novel, isn't it, is that once you, once you enter its world, simply someone closing a door on someone can make you go <gasps> like yeah. that in the most fantastic kind of way. Oh, that's made me think of Dorothy Parker again, one of my favourite poems of hers, Interior. Yeah. Oh, let me know if I know it off by heart. I'm going to take the gamble. Go on. Her mind lives in a quiet room, a narrow room and tall, with pretty lamps to quench the gloom and mottos on the wall. There all things are waxen neat and set in decorous lines. There are posies round and sweet and little straightened vines. Her mind lives in a quiet room, away f apart from noise and wind and pain and bolts the door against her heart, out wailing in the rain. Oh, wow. There you are. There's somewhere between Dorothy Parker and Mrs. Dalloway. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you have a very good... 20 yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's well done. That's good memory. Oh, you know, I'm very pleased I remembered that. That would have been <laughs> awful if I didn't. Yeah. Um, are you ready for some questions? Yes, absolutely. Shall we have some questions from lovely people who are watching all over the place? Oh, so, um, P.G. Woodhouse said, this is from Tony Brown, right, from Islington Libraries. There's no surer foundation for a beautiful friendship than a, than a mutual... Sorry, I, I can read, <laughs> but <laughs> I can't just, it's see. Small, it's small print. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to let you know, but I can't actually read. And there's no surer foundation for a beautiful friendship than a mutual taste in literature. Oh, this is a hard one. Which three books would you recommend to cement a beautiful friendship? Oh, that's very good. Um, well, it, it's one of those questions that you, you give a different answer to every day, I mm. think. Um, and if you're reading a really good book at the moment, you'll, you'll mention that rather than one you read three years ago. Uh, so um, there's one book I'd love to recommend because uh, it's just so astonishing. It's by a quite a Dutch Chilean or Chileno writer called Benjamin Labatut. Um, and it's called When We Cease to Understand the World. And it's it's extraordinary mixture of poetic biography of scientists and mathematicians, which sounds weird, but it's 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 poetic, mad, and it describes the way in the 20th century science moved into the insane realm of quantum, which makes no sense. Mm. Science suddenly stopped making sense, and Einstein was repelled by it. He famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe, and he couldn't bear. And yet the equations were true, but everything altered in the world. And the people responsible were such geniuses. And some of the stories behind them are incredible. One of the greatest stories of the 20th century, the, the most, I mean, I'm amazed someone hasn't done a film about it, is Franz Haber, a, a German chemist of unbelievable talent, who is probably responsible for saving more lives and causing a greater growth in population than any human being, because he was the first person to invent, and he won a Nobel Prize for it, a way of, of, of getting nitrogen out of the air, which was what allowed fertilizers. Before mm -hmm. then, there'd been a trade in bones. Uh, people had been digging up the bones of old buffalo killed in America, the, the millions of buffalo, and, and, and Egyptian tombs had been raided for their bones, and, uh, the, you know, and bat poo and guano were, were a huge thing. And suddenly, there was nitrogen. And starvation began to end of, of, of a certain nature and the population boom began at the beginning of the century. But he then went on for his country to develop chlorine gas, the gas used in the trenches of the First World War. And it, it, he, he went and he taught the men how to read the wind and how best to deploy it and was able to watch fr fr the fr French 
trenches with men shooting themselves mm. because of the agony of their burning throats, of the ap clawing their eyes out of the horror of this gas. His wife, who was a brilliant chemist, was so horrified by what her husband was doing that one day she walked out into the garden where he was talking to friends and shot herself. Oh, it was gosh. extraordinary. But it gets even worse than that. <laughs> he was Jewish. So by the 1930s, having won the Nobel Prize, he had been working on this insecticide that was so powerful. Um, it was called a cyclone, which in German is Zyklon. Mm. Zyklon B. And the huge irony is, of course, it was what was used by the SS to kill in their killing camps. It was the poison gas that was used in Auschwitz and all the killing chambers, including most of his family who were killed by it. So this one life encompassed so much. Uh, and it, it didn't stop there in a way because Zyklon B and, and its derivatives uh, became Roundup, which is the, the insecticide and, uh, that, that is responsible for so much damage to the environment to this yeah. day. So this, this it, 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 anyway, there are stories like that in it. And, and he become, what's so fascinating is the book becomes more and more fictional. So that's one book I'd recommend. What's the book? Of the whole it's book? called When We Cease to Understand when the World. When We Cease it's to Understand the World. published by a very wonderful little, uh, so it's good to, to recommend a good publishing house that's not that well known, called the Pushkin Press. Mm, uh, uh, yeah, Press, they're yeah. really good, aren't they? Um, so that, that's one. And then there are two European books that I always think, uh, uh, well, they're, they're not European, but they're kind of um, uh, have a European sort of... Um, one is Beware of Pity by uh, Stefan Zweig, which I think is, a, is an extraordinary book because it's such a marvellous description of how a tiny action can have such huge consequences. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine novel, I think. Um, and thirdly... What would I recommend? <laughs> I just have to choose one for the time being. You know, I, I, Ethan Frome by, by Edith Wharton. Do you know it? <laughs> it is a fabulous book. It's so un Edith Wharton. It's not like, um, it, it, it's not like a high society. I want to write all these down um, before I go because I want to be it, your it's, friend. It's set in the snows of a really hard winter in, in uh, New England. I think it's a, a great book. And um, so, so th those are the three I'd choose today. To what what do you friendship? choose? Well, you have way more intense friendships than I do. I was going to say The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole, age 13. What's wrong with that? That's a great call. <laughs> you know, for me, it's um, really, there's certain books that are very important to me that my kids read. Yeah. And they've got to read them at the right time. There's, it, there's no good, it's no good reading The Catcher in the Rye when you're 40. No, you have to you'd read be annoyed that. by it. <laughs> yes, you have to read that when you're an adolescent. Yeah. So there's certain promises that Very they've true. made me. And uh, it is the complete works of Adrian Mole, Catcher in the Rye, which is a book that I adore. And I think anything by Sue Townsend yeah. and Edgar oh, Allan Poe. Oh, The Queen Poe. and I. What are the, what the Queen the, and I. Yeah. But um, the, the book that I loved, um, that I found in a dusty old library belonging to a... a, a my father's friend had this massive uh, boarding school in Oxfordshire. So it was this big stately home. And we used to go there for Sunday lunch. And we were kids and we, you know, the adult conversation would bore us. So we'd go into the library, this massive library, and just read all day. And I found Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, yes. And I remember sitting down and reading The Cat and the Canary. The Cat and the Canary, the cask of Amontillado and the, yeah. the Telltale and Heart. The, the Telltale Heart the and pit the, pendulum, and the, pendulum. the Pit and the Pendulum. Yeah. And I read all this and I was like, like this in the car on the way home. <laughs> and uh, the stunning. first opportunity I could, I, uh, I bought it. Um, so they, those would be around my... But like you said, it's like saying, what are your three favourite albums? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what exactly. depends what mood you're in. So, um, Dallas Brooks asks, hmm. any favourite band books, seeing that as this is Band Books Week? Oh, well, yes. I know this causes many people to groan and they think anyone who says this is either lying or showing off, but Ulysses, which was, of course, a band book, uh, has the C word amongst many other, uh, many other naughtinesses. Um, I absolutely love it. I mean, it, 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 it is, of course, a, a monumentally, uh, a monumentally d sort of dense and rich book, so that uh, it, it's, it's like you know, recommending a, an, an extraordinarily heavy meal to someone. It, it is a book to be 
to be slid into and never to be worried about not getting, because mm -hmm. some of the language obviously is, is alarming to people. It's nothing like as difficult as Finnegan's Wake, but it is still for some people, you know, if they, you know, uh, c come across, you know, strange phrases like, Again, bite of inwit. They look at that and think, "What is that supposed to mean?" You know, <laughs> or, or ineluctable, ineluctable modality of the visible and phrases like that. And they think, "Oh, come on, just tell the story." You know, yeah. but it, it 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 really does get inside you. There's a beauty to it, a flow to it. Um, so that's one banned book. Um, Lady Chatterley's Lover, I'm not a great admirer of. Um, I, I've never quite managed to pierce the D.H. Lawrence veil, except as a poet. Mm. I love him as a poet, particularly as a funny poet. He wrote wonderful satirical poems about, there's one called The Oxford Voice, which I do as a party piece, which is, which is terrific, just sort of making, you know, about how you, you hear a certain accent in, when, when you're on a bus and you just want to shrivel up and die. And, mm. uh, and I know it that from both points of view, because I know it when I hear it, but I also fear that I sound it. Right. You know, and, and he's very good at that sort of thing. Um, who, uh, who else was banned? Um, well, uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn by Hugh, um, what was his surname? Selincourt, is that right? Anyway, uh, th that was a very banned book, and again, uh, uh, that was a very, very exciting book to read for me when I was you know, 17 or something, because it was so bruisingly frank about sort of gay life. Uh, but that was banned for a long time. A strange thought, isn't it? Uh, yeah, with, I don't want to get into this, but you know, we, we may be living at a time when books are going to be banned again. Um, and uh, people will say, ah, but this is for good reasons. And, uh, and you and I will have to go to the barricades and say there are no good there reasons. There are never any good never reasons. Good reasons never good reasons. Never good reasons to ban any, no. any words. No, I wouldn't ban Mein Kampf. I, uh, I, I would be disappointed to think that people were distributing it in schools and so or on and so on. Displaying it on their coffee table. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Mm. There's, um, it's, it's baffling Isn't what's it? happening at the moment with um, banning and shutting down and cancelling and stuff, mm. which perhaps is a conversation for another. I, I recently reread Lady Chatterley's Lover, um, actually, because I, when I was younger, I was a massive D.H. Lawrence You were, fan. yeah. Um, and I think for, for a million reasons... Where the, the region that he spoke about, because as I said, because I'm not from here, I, I was just really fascinated about the sort of, um, you know, the colliers and the world of a collier. Yes. What, what even is a collier? So I had to yeah. go and find that out. And, yeah. and the class, um, yeah. when, when he talks about class uh, and, and all of that sort of stuff, I don't know what, why I read it again recently. I think I'm, I'm going through a bit of a phase of rereading a lot of things that I read when I was uh, very young. And with fresh eyes, it's a completely yeah. different... It's not as wild as I thought it was. And, um, but I, I still have a very... Uh, I've got a soft spot for, for Lawrence. Yeah. He's, he does feel like... Um, the blood. He does feel life on the pulses, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, now with, with the head and the sensibilities I have now, the way he describes a woman's, you know, sexuality is a bit, you know... It, here's a book I'd recommend. In fact, two, two books by him, because he's, he's, a, he's such a sort of out-of-kilter academic literary critic and professor, mm. John Carey, do you know what I mean? Yeah. He, 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 I think the Sunday Times he's the yeah. literary editor of, and, and he's a professor, uh, or emeritus now, I think, or maybe not, uh, at Oxford, and he's written two, uh, two books... Uh, one is called An Accidental Professor, which is just a, uh, an autobiography about a, a young man, from, a clever young man from a quite ordinary family who just found that he had this gift of reading and he, he could read so intelligently, but so, so unlike anybody else. He was so out of the mainstream of, mm -hmm. either, of, of any sort of methodology. And, uh, um, and his, his, his other book is um, uh, Literature and the Masses, I think it's called. It's, it's basically... Uh, a rather brilliant attack on the snobbery of, of writers and how so much of the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century writers were snobs. They feared the masses. They thought mm. the masses were ugly and smelly and not good enough for, for, for their books. So he kind of really trashes Virginia Woolf and Ian mm. Forster. And, and the, the only ones he really champions are uh, um, Arnold Bennett, Really, and writers like that who went completely out of fashion now. But I'd recommend them because the, the, both books are so readable, and he's such a good, clear 
guide to reading. He makes you want to go and read, for example, Arnold Bennett and H.G. Wells and others who, who are rather out of fashion these days. Well, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, doing, a, I'm doing an open university MA next year in English literature. How fantastic. I'm very excited. Yeah. I'm very excited. Uh, you, have you, you haven't started it yet, then? Next year. And do you, have you got a reading list yet that they've given um, you? I or? have, actually. Yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah, some of it I've, I've read already, but I'm really excited about it. And when you were talking about Ulysses, I'm so excited about reading things with much more confidence yeah. than when I was younger, because I'm dyslexic. So uh, that, that was a real struggle. So there's only certain kinds of books that I could read. Um, yeah. And I think I've developed my own ways of dealing with it. Well, so. also there are companions to Ulysses, which which yes. are one. Uh, Anthony Burgess wrote a very good one. Samuel Beckett, uh, uh, Joyce's friend, also wrote, wrote one, a, 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 a perky one. Um, and and there's nothing wrong with, you know, saying oh. The, because you can't read it naked. You can't, as it were, you can't just walk into it and say, here's this book, yeah. I shall respond to it without knowing anything. Because it is keyed to the, the Homer's Odyssey yeah. and it, it has scenes that are related to it. And if you don't know that, you're missing a heck of a lot. Yeah. And that doesn't make it a failure of, of a book. It makes it more of an adventure. I think. Oh, you see, what we read the Odyssey, my son and I, when he was um, about eight, uh, uh, obviously a kid's version, mm. absolutely beautiful. And as I was reading it, I was like, oh, mate, like, I've only just, <laughs> you know, this is brilliant for me too. Um, yeah. One of the gorgeous things about um, having kids in your life is that you get to read the yes. sort of books that sparked your yeah. interest in reading in the first place. And a good writer is a good writer, whether they're writing for a 10-year-old or a, you know, or a, or a grown-up. Shall we have another question? Yes. Oh, right, click here to view. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Look how not good. There we go. There are all the questions. <laughs> okay. So, um, this is a question from Samuel Gita. Forgive my pronunciation if it's incorrect. Um, lest you should. I can pick this up, can't I? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm learning so <laughs> much today about technology. Lest you should think. He never could recapture the first fine careless, careless, careless rapture, rapture, Robert Browning. Do you think it's possible for literature to hit us with the same force once Brilliant we enter question. proper adulthood as it does when we're younger? That is such a good question. I, I have a particularly strong relationship with my adolescence, which is a long way away now. Um, but I so keenly remember being aware, even at the time, that art and literature was hitting me with a force that it probably never would again. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, and, and the Browning line um, about, you know, the first fine careless rapture, which you can't hope to recapture, is probably easier to remember with, with music because which of us didn't discover a, a song or a, a piece of music on a, on a rather crappy piece of uh, technology yeah. with, with bad earphones that we listened to again and again and again and sent us into a frenzy of joy. And now, perhaps, if we're lucky, we're well off, well off enough to have a much better sound system and can hear it as many times as we like. And we still love that piece of music, but we're never going to have that aha feeling, yeah. that absolute feeling. And there's no point regretting it. No. because that, that it, but, but you can... It's like when you go back to a, your school or something to, to give a talk and you think, this chapel was never as small as this. <laughs> it was huge once. Uh, you know, th things look different. and Time does extraordinary things to, to time and memory, to, to remarkable things, to, to, to physical objects and to things like books. But, but you go, su such is the power of the, the created world of a book. W whether it's high literature or a, a thriller, it doesn't really matter, but there can be a, believe me, a 50 year gap. And when you pick it up again, your mind is taken to the same room that you constructed the scenes in when you first read it. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you had a particular way of seeing Sherlock Holmes and Watson's room in Baker Street, when you pick the book up again, there it is again. Or a particular way of looking at Long John Silver or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter how long ago. 
it's all still inside your brain. And so there's that thrill yes. of going back. And it will be a bit smaller. And, but, you know, after all, when you're very young, sometimes, did you have that thing when there were illustrations in a book, there were some you were afraid of? And you'd turn the page rather slowly because yeah. you knew that picture was coming. <laughs> well, that's a marvellous thing, isn't it? And, and of course you won't get that back, but, but you might still get a little tickle of it. And, and yeah. it's necessary that, that we accept growing older and not having an, uh, the, 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 the mind and heart of a teenager, at least not only having the heart and mind of a teenager. We still have that heart inside us, but there's a, a few other ones that have accreted on top of it. And uh, I personally find age, I'm now 63, I find that a very pleasant thing to be. And the fact that it's not all, uh, it's not all passion spent. Do you remember that? That's a, mm. is that a Virago book, I, can't, I think, wasn't it? I can't remember who wrote it. But anyway, that, that great phrase, all passion spent. It isn't that exactly. It's, it's that the older you get, you are You're less involved, you're less frightened, you're less yeah. uh, ecstatic and euphoric. Um, things are less trans transcendent to you, perhaps. But you can choose to make them so. It, it, just, it doesn't hit you, mm -hmm. but you can move into it. So you can say, oh, I, I will submit to this book now. Yes. Whereas when you were young, you just don't have the choice. I it, love it, that you're less frightened. That's so true. Yeah, I think, and you're also more patient, aren't you? You, yeah. You, 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 yeah, yes, you are less frightened. Anyway. And actually, there's another part to the same question, which I really like. Um, which book affected you most deeply or turned your world view upside down in recent years? In recent years? Well, that's... <sighs> golly. Golly, golly, golly. I'm going to have to stop and think now. You, maybe you've got an answer <laughs> to that like question. Do a Has turned my world view number. upside... Well, <laughs> here, yeah, here's it. it, it hmm. This is to do with a, a certain kind of book that has become very popular over the last few decades, perhaps. The, the popular science book, the Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. Stephen Pinker, the, the uh, uh, Noah um, um, Harari, um, uh, th those sort of books have, have been very uh, um, influential uh, to the whole world, of course, Sapiens and Homo Deus mm -hmm. and... Uh, and, and books like that are, are great talking points and we all think about them. There are ways of, of, of looking at uh, human development and, uh, and the future and so on. But there's, there's one uh, uh, Dutch uh, writer, thinker, called uh, Bregman, Rutger Bregman, who, who's written a book called Humankind, mm -hmm. which I read a few months ago. He was kind enough, I was, all his publishers were kind enough to send me the manuscript. And it's a book that argues not not quite like Steven Pinker that everything's getting better, which is a harder position <laughs> to, to hold to now than it's ever been, I think. But it's, it's that the, the human nature is not as dark and black as we constantly think it is. The, the famous part of the book that was, as soon as it was published, was extracted by a lot of newspapers, was um, he, he makes this distinction, which is a, a pretty good one, as far as European philosophers go, between Thomas Hobbes and, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau, who, who believed that we were all wonderful children of nature and that it only civilization and hierarchies and so on had, had tamped down the human spirit and that if we were left to be children of nature, we would be good and happy. Thomas Hobbes believed the natural condition of man famously is nasty, brutish, and short, and that we are beasts, and we need to be controlled, uh, and we need to order. And between these two views, there's a, there's a little sympathy, really. Yeah. Um, and he, he sets out showing that actually we're a lot better and kinder than many people think. He exposes a lot of fallacies about people walking by on the other side or, you know, ignoring crime and so on. The famous stories in newspapers that turn out not to be true. Mm. And the most important one is the um, Lord of the Flies idea, mm. uh, which we all grew up on because it's yeah. like Catcher in the Rye. It was the, the British Catcher in the Rye in some ways, yeah. the book that all school children were, yeah. were made to read. And, and basically what it was telling us is that we're all beasts. 
and that if we're not uh, kept in order and we don't have a hierarchy or, or a system of order, we will turn to tribal monsters and Piggy will fall down the cliff and the conch will be broken and, and, and animals and, and painted and yeah. ululating and, and it will all be ghastly. Well, he said <laughs> in the most wonderful way, let's see if that's true. Has, it, has such a thing ever happened? And lo and behold, it had. A group of schoolboys had actually been marooned on a desert island in, or somewhere off Papua New Guinea in the 1950s or early 60s, Australian kids, and they had really been in just the same situation. And they had formed an orderly, happy society mm. in which they were kind to each other, looked after each other, and quite the opposite of the... Uh, so, th so that's the book, Humankind, I think. It's slightly... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily turn it upside down because I've always been a bit of a footling, sentimental opt optimist about human nature, if not human history and human behavior, certainly human nature. Uh, I do think, uh, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, whom the first questioner quoted, uh, always said, if you, if, you, if you throw a brick in Leicester Square, it's going to land on the, on the head of a, of, of, a, of a good person, of a, you know, a decent chap. Um, and he, he always claimed that when he lived in London, he would have a large correspondence, he would write his letters and he would he would put the address on the um, envelope with a stamp and seal it and throw it out the window, reasoning that the average person seeing a, a stamped addressed envelope would pick it up and post it. And yes. he claims he never had a letter go astray. <laughs> Do you write letters? Um, occasionally, and not mm. as much as I always feel I should. I deliberately try and push myself, I nudge myself to by having nice stationery and yeah. proper pens and ink and I look at it and think, I must, but yeah, I mean, I try to with thank you letters and, you know, the mm. sort of proper things you were brought up to, but my mother and her generation are so much better at it. Yeah, so it used to be an activity. What are you doing on Sunday? I'm, I'm writing letters. Yeah, and the great writers were great. I mean, Byron and Flaubert, their letters you mm. could read, you know, you could read for a year. They were so voluminous and so fantastic. I mean, just brilliant letter writers. Um, yeah, and, and indeed the novel started as really the first novels, almost all of them were, were uh, epistolary, weren't they? Mm. Even Pride and Prejudice originally was written as an as a epistolary novel and then I think she changed it. Wasn't Dickens as well? Didn't he? Um, well, he wrote in episodes. I right. don't think he didn't write them as letters no. to, to different people. Yeah. No, no. Okay, so um, of all your different written work over the years, Stephen, which, by the way, I to everyone watching, and I... I can read, and I also have bifocal <laughs> lenses, which I'm never wearing again. Um, which are you the most proud of, and why? And that's from Holly and Rachel. Which of your own work are you the most proud of? That's, uh, it, it, you know, the sententious answer is, uh, but you're asking which is my favorite child. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, um, in some ways, my second novel, The Hippopotamus, because it was a second novel, and, and I was terribly afraid that I would, the second novel syndrome would strike. And I liked the character that, uh, that emerged from it. And also because it had so many problems to solve structurally and I was pleased with that. But um, I can't answer that question. I really, I wish I could. Uh, I've, I, I'm aware of how lucky I am because I made my name, if that's the right phrase, it, 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 as a performer, a writer performer, I suppose in comedy. Uh, um, uh, it was easier for me to get books published and much easier for me to get them publicized mm -hmm. and, um, than it is most writers. And I can so imagine what a, an honest, diligent novelist would feel when she's walking along the street and she turns to look at the window of Waterstones or whatever and sees my books piled up in the front with a photo of me and she'll think, you know, because it's cheating. It's cheating to use your name to sell books. Uh, all, all I can say is I know I was born to be a writer more than I was ever born to be a performer, that, that, that the performance was an accident that mm. came out of writing, funnily enough. It was at university that I wrote a play and someone said, look, could, could you join this club, this performance club called The Footlights, and, um, w because we need writers for, to write some sketches and things, and I would perform them as well. And uh, so, but I do understand that um, it's so hard to get your book read and noticed yes. uh, anywhere. I mean, it's, it's all very well to talk about self Although I'm going to interrupt you and yeah. say, I think, I, I, I think that, that all of your, you didn't pull it out of a hat. 
it's not like oh, I'm, I want to try my hand at this. All performers, yeah. mm. all, all comics who write their own yeah. material, we are f of, of the world of writers. Yes, we write first. We exactly. write first. A comic the, yeah. is a writer first. Yeah. And that's why sometimes it, it's always a bit um, odd when uh, people write, you know, put comics and actors under the same umbrella. Yes. <laughs> and they're not. Comics and writers are um, much more um, close together. Yeah. Than, than actors and the most natural progression for a comic writer and performer is to then write a novel and it I, is really, it, I, yeah, I really it does think seem that like um, you're being yeah. very kind well, to unpublished writers oh, <laughs> I'm very <laughs> understanding <laughs> the hippopotamus was like amazing <laughs> okay so um, we have a question from Teresa and Sarah Ah, oh, can you recommend a novel as an antidote to COVID-19, please? <laughs> well, that's La Peste out, isn't it? Um, well, I mean, I've mentioned P.G. Woodhouse, and uh, I hope people might get tired of it. And he's not, he, I suppose, doesn't suit everyone, though I do think uh, if people knew what a great writer he was, I mean, mm. just simply at the level of the sentence, what a simply extraordinary uh, pusher of the pen or, or tapper of the keyboard, in his case, he was. Um, so I would always say, yeah, go, for, you know, read the inimitable Jeeves, for example, a collection of Jeeves taught stories, or, you know, Lord Emsworth and others, of Blanding's ones, because it's not just that he writes so beautifully, and they're not all just silly asses who are all mm -hmm. upper class brain oafs with monocles. It's not that sort of thing at all. There is a sunniness, an interior benevolence, which is very hard to find in many other writers. And it's not something that could be faked. It's, it's real. There's a, uh, Evelyn Waugh, who was quite the opposite. I mean, also a brilliant writer and a brilliant comic writer, but with a heart of malice and, mm. and, and cruelty. Um, he, he said, you know, he writes of Eden before the fall. It is a, a prelapsarian, I think is the word for that, isn't it? It, it is a, a you know, beds are for hiding under, not for sex. You know, it, yeah. it is in that sense innocent, which make, might sound it rather sort of peculiar, or, but it isn't. It's just sunny. It is of, of such a good disposition. He wrote him. He he, he wrote uh, in in one of his comic uh, sort of essays. He he wrote about how the majority of his letters came from um, prisoners and uh, people in hospitals when he came to, to 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 sort of tot up the letters he got, and he was saying that to another writer who said, so the, the sick and the, and the criminally disposed uh, are, are those who like your books. And, and Woodhouse thought, well, I suppose that maybe that's right. Well, there, and then he thought, well, maybe it's just those who most need cheering up. And, and, and it is just- Those who are stuck. It is to be cheered up is, yes. a, is a good thing. I, I, I know this sounds sort of rather weak, but I do think cheerfulness is, is the eighth of the, you know, the, the great virtues. It is such a, a wonderful thing and in the face of a world where cheer is hard to find not just stoical resolution and you know putting your head down and mm -hmm. facing the buffeting winds but actually to be cheerful is a remarkable thing and you don't have to be alive to be cheerful that's the, the glory of literature is that there are dead voices that can be raised to solace and to calm but also to cheer I totally agree with you. You know, right now we, we are really um, undervaluing cheerfulness mm. and we look for our camps of anger and, fury and frustration and, yeah, and yeah. all of that. And, mm. um, okay, so here is a question from Brian. As a teenager, I always intended to become a fiction writer, but in my 20s, and I'm now in my late 20s, I haven't been able to get back into it. What would you say is the trick to getting back into writing. Ah, well, the, the trick is to do it. To I, do I know it, that yeah. sounds silly, but, uh, uh, and the trick is not to let yourself stop doing it. Mm. But the, the most common experience, I think, for people who write is that they, they write a very good first page and a damn good second page, and probably the third page is excellent, and maybe a, a good chapter, and possibly even a good chapter and a half, and then, bang, they hit a wall, and they lose faith and confidence. And, and the, the advice I give, and it, it's not for everybody, but it, it sort of works for me, is write your way out of it. Mm. Just keep on writing and let it be nonsense. Yes. Because allow it to be a ball of plasticine. And, and the more plasticine there is, the more you can then go back and shape it. 
Yes. The, uh, Ma Michelangelo, when doing the David, didn't start on the toe and make the toe perfect <laughs> and then throw it away because it wasn't. And then finally, when that toe was perfect, the other toe, and then build up. From, like, he, he roughed out the shape and then went in. So you can do that with a book. So don't give up because it isn't perfect uh, uh, after the fourth page and uh, just keep going. Absolutely. There, um, and if I may also offer my advice, I've only, um, I'm, I'm on my third book writing yeah. and you say you're in your late 20s, Brian J. I remember all, always knowing I was going to write books, but also in my 20s I, and, and early 30s, I knew that I wanted to be out. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a stand-up comic and I, and I knew that it wasn't until I was older I would have... I would want to hold yeah. myself away. Um, and I remember when I was writing my, my second book, um, I was stuck and I didn't know what to write. And um, my, my son, who I think was about nine at the time, 10, what good ages they are, hmm. um, he went, oh, come on, mummy, just let the dumb stuff out first. Yes, right. how wise. And Absolutely it is, it's right. let the dumb stuff yeah. out. Don't be afraid yeah. of being terrible yeah. in any creative endeavour. Because you, no reader is reading it while it's done. Absolutely. You, you, you've always got the chance to go back and improve it and improve it and yes. improve it. Especially with the technology of word processes and so forth. And it's quite fun as well. It, it, you, you rewrite. You, yeah, you, always, you exactly. It, 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 Thomas Mann said, a writer is just an ordinary person who finds writing more difficult than anybody else. In other words, yes. writers realise how hard it is and that doesn't stop them. Because yes. most people think, oh, I'm finding this too difficult, I can't be a writer. No, if you're finding it difficult, that means you are a writer. Yes. A writer understands how hard it is. It is insanely difficult to write. Yeah. I mean, just, what, what are, I mean, there are three major elements, I suppose you could say. There's character and there's story and there's language. And each one of those, different people find, you know, hard. Some people find the, the getting the right characters difficult. Others have the characters just walking in and, and announcing themselves in their books, but can't make a plot, can't make a story, mm. can't get a character out of a room into a hospital visit. Do I, do I take them out of the room, down the stairs, into the car, yeah. along the street? That's my or do I just heel. cut? Structure. You know, we use yeah. cinematic <laughs> language, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then you go to look at another book. How do they do it? And, and all of that, everybody goes through that. They're, they're bound to. Um, and that's part of the, the excitement. Do I do he said or he replied, she she said curtly, adjectives are always bad, aren't yeah. they? Or are they? Oh. <laughs> and, you know, there is a, the problem. All those are issues of self-consciousness. Yes. And as with acting or any other form of uh, uh, sport, you know, any other form of performance, really, self-consciousness is, is what makes you fall from the, the, the tightrope. Um, and if, if you could just, uh, uh, you know, abandon the self, it's weird because you're throwing yourself into it it is yourself controlling your universe, but don't think there's a teacher watching you, or there's a you know, or, or that you're your own teacher. Just let it. Because it's hard sometimes. I because I um, a few years ago I started reading Coetzee for the first. Is that how you pronounce his name? Could say, I, Could yeah, say yes. is the Dutch Afrikaans yes. way, but yeah, all kinds and of ways. So for ages, Brilliant. when I was writing, I, I was like, well, it's there's far too many words in this sentence. Yes. He wouldn't have written it like that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have to personally... It's the Hemingway problem, yes. Exactly. I have to stop reading yeah. if I'm writing yeah. because they get into my head and... There's a very good book I'd recommend to anybody by Cyril Connolly, who was a great arbiter of literary taste in the middle of the 20th century. And he wrote a book called The Enemies of Promise. And the first half of it is a description of two different kinds of writing, which is very simplistic in a way, but... It's pretty, he calls one Mandarin, which is ornate language, language that is self-conscious and flowery. It doesn't have to be actually flowery, but which relishes the joy of the text and the word. And there is the non-Mandarin, which we think of as like, you know, Hemingway. Mm -hmm. Nick saw the fish and Nick's father said, that's the fish. And Nick said, I see the fish. You know, wow. But somehow it's brilliant in the hands of Hemingway, but it is absolutely bald and clear, like good thriller writing, like, like Lee Child or something like that, yeah. you know, the Jack Reacher writing. Really clean and, you know, without ornament. Um, I, I realised very early on I couldn't write like that. I just, you know, and it, it annoys some people. There's a profusion of words. I just love doing that. Some, yeah. some I have to trim them back, but, but, but I want the growth of language. I, I, I like that. And, and you have to decide what kind of writer you are. I think that's 
yeah and, and I think you have to be very um kind with your with yourself and, yeah. and think you know I know that I'll probably never write the sort of books that I I read but that's okay because what I write I've, sorry I'm just going to go on about this you've asked about writing now <laughs> that's your own fault um I write in the voice of a 17-year-old, 16-year-old yeah. um, young woman yeah. in my first novel and in this novel. And I think I'm going to have to do this until I stop doing it. Yeah. Whatever book I write... And that's fine. And that's what your readers will probably want. ...is an adolescent yeah. voice. I can't write in my own age yeah. yet. We shall see. Maybe I'm just... Or as the old joke has it, avoid cliches like the plague. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. OK, so... Okay, this is from Naomi Caligaro. Could you please comment, and this is directed to you, Stephen. She didn't specify that, but I'm going to throw it All to you. Right. Could you please comment on the role of Irish writers in English literature? Oh, it's enormous, isn't it? Well, particularly in the 20th century, of course. I mean, there are these giant Irish writers, Joyce and Beckett and uh, uh, Shaw, who is less fashionable now, of course, and the playwrights. Um, and all, all the way up through the John Banvilles and so on. And um, I suppose it's a very noticeable thing that English, which is the language of the oppressor in Ireland, mm. was taken by them and repurposed into a, a living, flowering thing that they, they made better than, than, than the English. I mean, you know, the whole, ah, the joy of it, you know, the thrill mm. of it, the, 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 the intensity and the wit and the, um, and indeed, the Mandarin language, the, the, sheer, the sheer belief that language is a musical instrument in everybody's throat mm. and that it can seduce and beguile and delight is a very Irish thing. And it, it's spat back at the British to some extent, you feel that we're all too, I say, you can't talk like that, you know. Mm. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of uh, what we, <laughs> we charmingly call Commonwealth writing. Mm. In, in other words, ex-colonial yeah. uh, English writing from Nigeria and, uh, and the West Indies and all kinds of other places, that, is that uh, um, English force majeure is the language they speak. Force majeure is not English, Stephen. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> preposterous way of putting it, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, and um, and if they're going to speak it, they're not going to speak it as it were with the finger on the forelock. They're going to speak it proudly. And so I think it's it's there's something so energetic about Irish literature. It's been it's been a, you know a, a force of uh, uh, in 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 our literature that is hard to overestimate, isn't it? And I, I love it. I mean, I've started rereading Beckett's, um, not plays, but his, you know, M Malone dies and all that fall. And he just, I mean, it's mm. breathtaking. You have to put the book down mm. and go, oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have to read it out loud as well because it's so, so oral. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you, do you read out loud to yourself? A lot. It's well, uh, during lockdown, I, I have, uh, uh, I'm mostly in, been in Norfolk where I, have a place where all my families, my mother's not that far away, and my sister and my brother, all, all the family are there. But I have this um, sound studio. I mean, it, it sounds very grand. It's, it's, it's not like some Soho thing, but it's, yeah, I mean, it is a, it's purpose built. It's a thing you can get. And um, so I've been reading, reading books for, for, uh, for audio, for audio books, uh, mm. which, which is a fantastic pleasure. And uh, for example, I, I did some Orwell, and um, I'd never, never read Orwell out loud. Orwell is one of those writers. Everybody kind of knows Animal Farm in 1984. Uh, they know the stories. And, but if you, if you had someone who could do a parody of an Orwell paragraph, I'd, you know, I'd give them a, a large amount of money because does he have a style? He has a, he has a perfect non-style. He, yeah, he you're actually right, yeah. he wrote about it. Uh, Graham Greene's slightly mm. similar. You kind of think you can't do a parody of that. You could do a parody of so many writers, but a pastiche of mm. Orwell. You'd only do a pastiche of 1984, but that wouldn't be of Orwell. It would be of the story. Of the story, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was fascinating to read it out loud, and you realise he does have certain mm. certain mannerisms which are very interesting and very which repeat a lot. You become so much more aware of a writer's use of language when you read it out loud. There's no question about that. I get quite emotional. I, my voice cracks sometimes yeah. if I'm reading yeah. out loud, if I want to read a, you know, I got really excited about some poem and I, I went to read it out to a friend and 
because I'm standing in my kitchen to go, whoa. Um, yeah, it is, absolutely. Do, do, you, um, do you listen to audiobooks at all? Do you plug I've in? I just started yeah. to. I, 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 was a, I, was, I never used to, but um, I do now. And this is an age thing. I used to run and listen to music, but now I run and listen to audiobooks. Yes, I found with music, you're always stopping and saying, oh, no, not that track. Not I'm, that track. Yeah, this yeah, isn't another hitting one. the yeah. mark. Whereas but the sometimes story. they are um, edited. Um, oh, no, I, I can't be doing which that. Is a bit, but I didn't You've realize got to look for the, else, yeah. the U word, unabridged. But yeah. what, what I did find was um, I was listening to, uh, to something on audio and out loud I repeated a phrase I just heard because it was, it was so beautiful. I just found myself sort of outside yeah. boots sort of talking out loud to myself and I was like no this is good it, it is good it felt really good to have a companion t t telling you a story as you go for a it's walk the best thing. fantastically good it's yeah. the best thing we used to have them when I was a kid tapes yes tapes of stories that oh, I, I did the Harry Potter books and uh, um, the, the, <laughs> you, you, you spent about half an hour afterwards going side A oh you yeah, know it was uh, Cassette three, side A. Cassette three, side B. Cassette four, side A. And you just drive you mad. <laughs> there were so many. It's exhausting mm. as well. Yep. Um, okay, who is your favourite female author? That's tough. <laughs> it's very tough. Uh, I hope so. I don't really notice the gender, which is quite <laughs> nonsense. Uh, I, it, it's, it's, you can't dismiss Jane. Um, uh, I, I take great pleasure every year in reading. <laughs> this is really pretentious, but the, the Oxford edition of Jane Austen on Oxford India paper, w w which has this peculiar thing, at the bottom right of every page is the first word of the next page. Oh, right. I don't know what, there's probably a printer's name for that little yeah. thing. I'd never seen it. It's the only sort of big edition I know that in. And I am, always have been passionate about Jane Austen. That and Persuasion and Mansfield Park, mm. those three. Emma I do like, and I like all the others as well, but particularly love Mansfield Park. I don't know why, some people find it rather overdone. George Eliot, I mean, hard to, hard to beat George Eliot. I mean, she's probably, of whatever gender you want to talk of, the the greatest mind of any novelist, I think, that I've ever come across. Just the most intelligent, I suppose, is the word you want to use. Mm. Just extraordinary feeling of being in the presence of something, of sort of a real mighty intellect, which it, it's not because it wears itself heavily, but because you just know that there's something so important in the way she tells, tells you things and makes, I mean, there's a, is it in Middlemarch, there's a phrase I remember thinking, this is what writing does that nothing else can do. Music even can't really do it. She writes about how a mirror, a pier glass, if it's been polished by a clumsy maid, it has random scratches all over it. And if you look at its surface, it just has random lines where it's been scratched. But if there's a lamp, you put it under a lamp, all the random scratches turn into a sort of nest, a round shape, which is shaped by the light. And she uses that as a metaphor both for religion, the light of God makes sense of what is completely random and haphazard, but also of reason. So, you know, a religious person can think, that's a brilliant image, but so can a non-religious person. That all the accidental scratches that make up this randomness of the universe into which we were born. If you shine a light at them, they gather into a ball that makes sense. And I stop and think about that, and that's the kind of thing George Eliot can do that very few other writers can. It's just it's simple. I mean, it's, it's, she probably didn't think much of it. It's just a quick sort of thought, but I remember being staggered by it, just thinking, that's it. That's beautiful and a beautiful way to end a discussion mm. I have enjoyed so, so much. So have I. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank for you. Chatting. You're this such a really good special. companion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, let's, let's um, hope we can do this one day with real life people. Yes, and thank you for watching, and thank, thank you, you especially to all the libraries that have, uh, that have enabled this, and good luck to you all in this time. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for watching. It's been a real treat.
Thank you, Stephen and Sharpie, for a splendid conversation. If you want to come to more events like these and for free, please do join the Royal Society of Literature. Membership starts at a mere 40 pounds and gives you access to the RSL's events, our publications and our book groups. Members will also have special access to the RSL's 200th birthday announcements at the end of November. So do join us through rsliterature.org. Thank you to our partners, the British Library, the Living Knowledge Network, and of course, the wonderful Union Chapel. And now, from all of us in this beautiful building in the heart of Islington, have a very good evening.